back. I said there'd be a part two, and I wasn't lying. We're here, the second part day. Part two, here we but are. It, but it's like a lifetime has passed it already. It does feel that way, though. It's been Doesn't quite it? timeless, hasn't it? <laughs> it has been no, quite it, timeless. Yeah, I woke up this morning. I thought, there's no way that that, that is quote-unquote 24 hours. There's just <laughs> absolutely no way. Indeed, my friend, indeed. So we're here with Hamilton Souther, and again, going to go deep down the rabbit hole um, and explore a lot of things. And as I've gotten to get to know you a little bit better, um, really, you've been something of a disruptive technology in the ayahuasca shaman field and that's really what i've kind of learned about you is you've initially started down the path and then realized okay you know what are these things that could be improved what are these things could be optimized which way do i want to go and take this so i'd love to kind of jump into your story a little bit and uh and kind of set that groundwork before we get into uh, the gem that we're going to drop on everybody here at the end. <laughs> Holy shit, get ready, people. <laughs> okay, um, when I started drinking ayahuasca, first it was not a fat or a thing. It was uh, strictly a traditional healing practice in the Amazon. And um, I was really blessed, like truly blessed to be able to work with two elder master shamans. Well, tell us how you, I mean, you came to them through some visions. That you I did had, come right? to them through some visions and through some hardship. And I think that, you know, for anybody out there who's on the path, that aspect of it needs to be spoken about that. It's not just, <laughs> it's not just smooth, right? Like it's right. A, there's a little friction along the way, but yeah, I, I ended up with these two, two great elders. Um, basically, they had had visions that I was going to come before I ever came, but they never let me know that. So they were always leaving me on the precipice of doubt. Mm -hmm. And um, I had gotten into some some hairy situations in the Amazon my first year down there, some falciferous malaria. And that's probably the closest I've ever come to physically dying. And some, you know, not such great shamans of good intention because I was very naive about the whole thing. So I had to do a little dabble and in that kind of, you know, right. frosting. <laughs> you can't, yeah. get into you can't just drop yourself in the middle of the jungle as a gringo and hope that it's going to work right the yeah, very I mean, first time out. You may be a little bit of the mouse in the cage with the snake at first, yeah. right? Maybe yeah. just a little bit like that. And, um, and so I worked through all of that and I finally got to Alberto and I first went to Alberto for healing because I had, you know, gotten involved in some stuff that needed to be healed, right? Mm -hmm. I was not well at that point. And then from from working with Alberto, I got to know Julio, but Julio had actually denied me apprenticeship my first year. Mm -hmm. He was like, I'm too old. You know, it's like it took me too long to get there. And so he was already in his mid to late 80s. And the rigors of taking on an apprentice takes a lot out of you when you're the master shaman guiding. You know, it's like having a new child, yeah. you know, and it's an adult child who doesn't know anything. And in my case, like knew nothing. I did not know how to canoe. I did not know how to like just even walk in the And forest. like a child, you'd be shitting and vomiting yourself constantly. The whole time. I mean, constantly, <laughs> right? And these guys' teaching methods were like, drink this and we're not going to tell you anything about it. Uh -huh. You know, so I, I met I, old school, old school. I mean, this was this was old school. We can get to that in just a second. But I uh, I walked by I was walking by Julio's house, which was 400 yards from my house. This is just a footpath. We're, I mean, imagine, dude, there is nothing out there. There is other than forest. It's virgin Amazon forest with, you know, 40, 50 people living on hundreds of miles. And that's it of, mm -hmm. of jungle. And so I was walking by his house and I heard him screaming. And I so I run in, run up into his house like little palm bark floor, like tiny little, you know, hut in the middle of the jungle. And I see him there with his leg super swollen. So I started doing chupada healings where you like suck out the, the bad stuff and blood's filling my mouth and I'm spitting it out and the skin's unbroken. This is like right out of Twilight Zone mysticism. Whoa. Four in the wait, afternoon. Wait, how, how much time have you been down in the jungle? Uh, like formally, formally, literally like a, at that point a year, but... I had only been training sort of kind of with ayahuasca for maybe a couple months. Wow. Yeah. No, I mean, I was seat of the pants, having no idea what I was doing, but Julio's going down. Alberto's five days in the forest. There's no way to get to him. Someone's got to suck. Someone's got to do something. <laughs> and so I'm just like, give me your potions, give me your mapacho, and let's do this. And so, so I, I did that healing on him for uh, four days and healed him. Uh -huh. And so at that, we had this very Yoda moment because he was just like Yoda. I mean, he had the big pointy ears and everything, right? Yeah. Like all shrunk down, his little mapacho, you yeah, know, it's speaking yeah. sentence fragments and stuff, but <laughs> deep wisdom and everything that he said. Right. 
And so, and he just said to me that the, the medicine was strong in me. And what did I? What did he owe me? Right for like now, for everything he says, I hear in Yoda voice. It's how it is. But strong that's how, in me, the medicine strong was. Strong in me, the medicine was. <laughs> yeah. And so he, oh man, if he spoke, you listened because if yeah. not, that night in, in ceremony, you know, when he when he would literally shape shift into having a jaguar head and a human body, and you would look at him and be like. Yeah, that's impossible, but that's real. You know, you listen. Yeah. You, when, when like stern grandfather has a jaguar head on, you listen, yeah. right? <laughs> For real. So I told him I didn't want. I didn't want it's good advice. Good advice. <laughs> good advice. Good advice. Hamilton. Anybody has a jaguar head on, listen. Listen. Just, listen, just, listen even if it's not stern grandfather, if they got a jaguar head on. Yeah, I mean, you don't li- fuck with them. You listen. Yeah, there's <laughs> no doubt. There's no, and I don't mean like put on a a like <laughs> like a dead jaguar that they killed in the forest head. I mean, no, like he no. shape shifted his head so that if you were sober or not and you looked at him you would see a jaguar head on a human man i mean this is like as deep (laughs) as this mystic guy was in the forest and so i told him i wasn't interested in payment what i wanted was to be trained right so i wanted to be one of them right Mm -hmm. i was like i want to be one of you and alberto and right when i said that alberto walks out of the forest like this is like on cue it's like would have been in a movie but yeah he literally walked out of the forest like julio what's wrong he runs up he checks julio He's like, I dreamt you five nights ago that you had gotten sick and that I rushed back because he was out on this hunting trip. And and he and Julio looks at him and goes, like, like the white guy healed me, right? Like, and so they never told me, but um they had a meeting that day. I only found out when they filmed a documentary about us and Alberto oh, wow. told the story. They never told me anything. They they had a meeting and they agreed to train me. You know, and so that's like when formal, like formal apprenticeship training started. Yeah. That's <clears throat> So you said some things in there that people are going to be like, what is he talking about? You were sucking blood out of his leg that there was an unbroken skin. Yeah. And his head was transforming into a jaguar. Yeah. So clearly the paradigm that you were operating under is a little bit different than the paradigm that most people account as as real. But for you, that's you were there. You I was there. It, and, and, and I want to you know really emphasize that I was in a lot of fear and doubt. Yeah. I was not a believer. <laughs> Okay, I had not, you know, drunk the Kool Aid and was believing this. I was trying to figure out what was real and what wasn't real. I was stuck in a paradigm of real and unreal because I was hanging out with people that would say things in a stone cold straight face, just like I did, that blew my mind, <laughs> and I could not fathom that as being part of normal, ordinary reality. Like every time they said goodbye to each other in the forest, they said, "Call me if you need me," and I know for a fact neither had used a telephone. <laughs> So how could two guys be saying, we're going to like, you know, part, call me if you need me until they, you know, they taught me those, those arts. And I mean, it is right out of the twilight zone. This is how they, you want to know how they do it? Yeah. You want to know how that checks yeah, sure. out? Okay. There's a kind of spirit in the forest that whistles. Uh-huh. Okay. It has a very distinct whistle. So they send that spirit to go find the spirit of the shaman, wherever the shaman is in the astral planes. Okay. That, those, that consciousness link is to the physical body. So that spirit goes and finds them and then whistles a ringtone, just like on your iPhone or on your, your Galaxy or whatever, to make the shaman aware of, oh, check in to see who's calling. And then in their vision, then they link once they've gotten the shaman's attention with the spirit that literally whistles. It's just an astral telephone. It's exactly what it is. It's the exact <laughs> no same problem. technology, right? Yeah. And which is why they use the exact same words. And I know it seems like unbelievable right there's impossible that this could could actually be happening but if you read anthropological texts the anthropologists who studied tribal peoples from around the world have story after story after story after story of these incredibly psychomagical mystical experiences happening as normal and so what i think's happened is that the development of the western mind and western educational systems have trained the brain and trained the mind and trained the identification away from these skills. But it's not that that human beings don't inherently possess mm-hmm. these capacities. I think we do. They're just lying dormant. Yeah, I would I would tend to agree with that. And what I think one thing we talked about yesterday is one of the things that I think needs to happen is these people with these skills need to be brought out and shown. You know, these things need to be shown to the world to open up the mind's capacity for believing that these things are even possible you know like right now you can listen to any skeptic who will you know stone cold refute every instance of paranormal mystical you know any of these kind of instances and i think 
if we could at least shake that foundation a little bit and say, hey, there's other stuff out there. It's not that there's no science to explain it. It's just we haven't been looking in the right spot yet. You know, yeah. and I know that's a definitely a big part of your your overall mission. But the more that we could do that and just say, hey, open your mind to more possibilities, even if we don't know the empirical Newtonian cause and effect way that this works yet because our minds are too small you know like like somebody who can't see wi-fi because they don't have a fucking wi-fi detector it's yeah. there you yeah know? yeah so. let's give it give it time i mean let's just make a call out to everybody who hears the podcast if you know of these things and you're interested in participating <laughs> write us and yeah. Yeah. let's start to to put together a think tank and a coalition of people who want to prove this stuff and you know with with no bias like that's, that's where i am with it i've i've proven this stuff to myself over 14 years i've seen miraculous healing take place at our center every week for 14 years i don't need to prove this anymore there are skeptics out there and you know it's, an opinion is simple in this world it's just really simple to have an opinion and it's really simple to sell an opinion and it's really hard to do something <laughs> it's really hard to organize and build something and right. make something that really helps people and negative opinions that just shut down the possibility of something greater in life doesn't do anything to help humanity no nope. and so i just say like you know your time's numbered that's it like <laughs> like people are, are organizing to show with real scientific bias that there's something to all of these different forms of healing and transformation. No doubt about it. All right, so let's fast forward a little bit. All right. You get to a point, you were explaining to me yesterday, 500, 500 ayahuasca sessions, played it by the book, stuck with yeah, tradition. And then sure. after that, you started to take a look and say, hmm. Yeah, okay, so you get deep into the tradition and you start drinking ayahuasca and you're in these dietas and so this is like training for the people who aren't familiar. This is like hardcore shamanism training, just like if you're at med school and then residency and you're going to be a doctor or a surgeon or something like that. This is for the, the Amazonian people, really, really intense. And um, I started to really look at their culture like an anthropologist, right? Like I was studying it as I was learning it, as I was living it, I was studying it. And I started to see some things that I would consider to be issues. You know, just fair enough. Like, I love the medicine. I love the culture. I pay homage to it all the time. But I also saw there's some issues. There's a tremendous amount of conflict. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous amount of this idea of battle. There's this tremendous amount of sort of like real, real core tribal, you know, nature and vibe and mythology to it. And, um, I, 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 and I saw that the greatest growth to people interested in this were Westerners. Mm. And I thought, okay, if you want to really understand the tradition, you have to study the tradition. You have to understand the mythology. You have to understand the collective terms. You have to understand, uh, you know, where the, the people are, are coming from. And you have to learn their psyche. Like when I first got down there with these guys, even though we could speak the same language, I couldn't understand them. Yeah. I literally couldn't understand them because the way that they formulated thought and then used language to try to express that thought was so foreign to me. And it was already outside my paradigm of reality. I had no idea at first what they were talking about. So you put all of that through, you know, about 500 ayahuasca ceremonies. Mm -hmm. And I had already by that point gained the sort of the rank of considered maestro and I was practicing on my own and all of that. And I started to want to address some of those issues, see if if that really is the way that it is, or or maybe that's a cultural component, mm. you know? And so I started to explore beyond solely the, the traditional ways of practice in conjunction with Westerners coming, looking for healing for, you know, their problems. And um, I realized that there were a lot of different ways that we could start to take this medicine form, not lose the essence of the tradition, but start to enhance it and build upon it and allow it to grow and evolve. And at first there was trepidation, like, you know, are you going to get the cosmic smackdown for doing this? <laughs> right, like, right, who right. are you, big boy, to be like yeah. taking this medicine in that direction? And, um, you know, it was the same answer that I always had through apprenticeship, which is like, well, this is just what I'm doing. So. You know, if it's not OK, I'll know. And if it's OK, it'll all work out. And yeah. And for me, it, it it represented as as something that not only was OK, but expansive. You know, we had even better results. We had, uh, you know, healings that before in the other modalities wouldn't have even been possible. Yeah. One story you shared, which I'd love for you to share again, is you were talking about dieting the plants one at a time. And at sure. a certain point. You know, that requires an immense amount of time to diet these plants one at a time. And at a certain point, you're like, ah, oh, 
maybe we can do this a little differently. Tell that story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from the very beginning, I was already thinking that because <laughs> dieta, dieta, you know, really, first of all, it's incredibly strict, right? Right. And um, and so yeah, we, I mean, you hear this this idea in the traditions that you know you're supposed to diet one plant at a time. You know, maybe two, maybe maximum three, but oh, by there, the jealousy of the spirits is a big issue, and they're all called reseloso and celoso, and they have this, all this whole concept that they're not, not like getting along, and my sort of rational scientific mind could not handle that, because I'm sitting there going like, okay, wait a second, like, it's enough for me to think that like I'm putting tree spirits in my body. Right? Yeah. I, I, you already I, got me that I, far. I, I, I okay, but now they're like angry with each other and stuff. I'm like, wait, no, no, this is what I deal with like in, in normal everyday right. life. This is like high school. Like yeah. I'm not going back to spirit high school, you know, with all of these spirits in yeah. me. And and so I tried to understand what was really being said. And then I came to to finally understand that the they're talking about different kinds of energies or different kinds of spirits within the plants, not all of them, right? Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, I'm not interested in those guys anyway. I'm here for medicine. I'm here for, you know, Ikaro medicine and divine knowledge and learning. And so I figured they would all be able to get along. And so I asked Alberto, I said, like, you know, can, can I diet all the plants? And his response to can was always, of course you can. <laughs> but, but you got to be up for whatever happens. Right, I mean, right. You got to be up. So he said, you know. Can and should. Can, are two the, totally different the things. In right. their world, it's very literal. You yeah. Know? And so um, he said, yeah, you can, but you'll go crazy. And he said, so, you know, promise me you won't do anything stupid when you're crazy. And so I started to diet, you know, eight plants, 10 plants, 14, 16, 18, 20, 28 at a time. And what I found was that when you go into that process, each plant spirit makes like a holographic version of you. And so it's training you, you know, 28 different versions of you at the same time. And uh, you definitely feel like you're a little wonky in the head because you got <laughs> you have 28 minds, right? right? Like normally we're used to having one mind, but imagine now having 28 minds, like 28 computers all linked, all learning, you know, something at, different at the same time. But uh, in my case, I mean, I just uh, I, I made some very simple rules of engagement, you know, which was like no repetitive rocking motion because that can really start to freak out your head, you know, like, you you know, when you look at like people who are suffering, you know, tremendously mentally, yeah. there's certain kind of behaviors that are demonstrated. So those out. <laughs> and if, if I can't, you know, behave in a way that I knew growing up is appropriate for society, well, you don't go, you know, you just lock yourself in your house for a day or two until it all yeah. calms down, you know, as part of that, like really hardcore training. But again, this is not like a, a, a recommendation at home. This was part of intense, intense shamanic training. There's, you know, not a lot of people who could who could withstand that kind of heat, you know, and and and, and be able to put themselves through that that kind of situation. <laughs> what is it, you know? What is it? Is it something that you were just kind of born with, or is this something that you've cultivated? Is this something that we all have in us if we have the willpower, or, or what is this? Because that sounds like like the worst idea I've ever I've ever heard for myself personally. Or, yeah, or, I mean, I, you know. We got to put it into context. I was in my early 20s. Uh -huh. I had a certain amount of aptitude. Yeah. I had already received a very traditional calling and I loved it more than anything. And I had gotten to a point that I was completely committed that if I died through the process, I was accepting of that. You put all of that together and I just was able to squeak by, right? <laughs> you put all kind of you kind of like put a perfect scenario together, but especially during that period of time in my life, like that's what I lived for. Mm. You know, it wasn't like I went to go to the Amazon and participate in some ayahuasca and then I went home and gained benefits. Like I went and I stayed and I went to learn and train and I took it very seriously. And I was blessed to have two maestros that taught me in the traditional way. They tr treated me like blood relatives and made it very, very difficult for me to learn as a training method. Like when, yeah. when I sat down with Julio, I asked him if a white guy could learn. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, can a white guy learn this? Cause I didn't see any other like real white guy learning this. And he goes, we all bleed red <laughs> if you can survive, right? And like, that's how we started. This was not like touchy feely Montessori school. This was yeah. like, you know, you're gonna bleed and if you can make it through that, like, you know, then you can make it. Mm -hmm. um, and in my case, you know, it was it was something that was a passion. And I think if you have like a true passion for something and some aptitude, you can turn it into something amazing. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. Yeah. So your processes, 
accelerated your learning and then you continued that opened up blue morpho started offering healings there but there was a point and i want to get to that there was a point where you got on to the the scent of something really fucking big and yeah i got a little taste of that yesterday and and, and to close this out i want you to kind of take our audience through what you took me through but yeah. tell us about this new thing that you started to to encounter and how it kind of solved the problem of these shamans going to fight night and throwing darts at each other yeah yeah um so I would say eight years into the process. Now, eight years, that is eight years living in the Amazon, participating in ayahuasca at least 100 to 120 times a year, like just in it, right? I came to, to a focus on what I called universal mysticism and universal love. And that ex, ex spread to universal consciousness and then to universal definition of consciousness. So what that means in a practical way is, what aspects of life are universal to all of us? Like, so could we, could we t look at anything that would apply to every single human being, regardless mm -hmm. of language, culture, age, anything, you know, how could we, how could we deduce that and how could we rationalize it into a cohesive understanding? Cause it's, it's all over the place. Our mind is taught to, you know, focus on pieces, not the whole. And I started to get really interested in the whole and and then that started to evolve how we could we could work with ayahuasca, mm -hmm. right? And so really it started with universal love. I noticed that love was a, a piece that was universal to all people. And then I looked at mysticisms and I saw that love was sort of the ultimate expression. And by the time it gets to that ultimate expression, it's sort of right at that boundary of quantum uncertainty and this cosmic expression. And I saw a lot of correlation between that and the notion of God and... Um, so I started to look to, to really try to, to compile all of these pieces. That all took me back into the States. I had left the Amazon after 12 years. I was back in the States and suffering extreme chronic pain, like mm -hmm. unbelievable chronic pain. And now I was back in the US medical system oh. and with now uh, pre-existing conditions and incapable of being able to get medical insurance. And so think about it, I'm in my mid thirties I've been abroad for 12 years. There I can get medical treatment without any problems. The costs are no problems. It's all completely available. Everything's available. Anything that you need is available. And I come back home and I can't get treatment and I couldn't afford it. And so I was like in that crux. And so somebody, a good friend of mine said, you know, try medical marijuana. And I'm like, no, no, we can't do that. You know, all this Amazonian training didn't really like in the traditions, didn't really sure. comply. And finally, I just said, you know, the pain's too bad. I'm going to do it. So I, uh, you know, I, I got on the vaporizer mm -hmm. and I uh, got my medical card, you right. know, which I found out that I could get. Yeah. <laughs> right. I could go get a medical card, but I couldn't get, you know, physical therapy for my hip. Right. So well, I. Well, the, the, the former is probably better than the latter anyway. Hey, so. you know, so, so we went with that. And by the fourth, but the first time, I mean, I consumed it solely for the purpose of chronic pain, but I had, uh, you know, shamanic mystical awakening with the plant. I mean, you know, I was applying the same things that I had learned down in the Amazon in conjunction with the use of the plant. Never in my mind before that had I thought the plant had those capacities or capabilities because, mm -hmm. you know, it just it wasn't in the collective concept or the culture around the plant. And then I had this incredible explosion and I realized, wow, we can use this. This is big. We can use this for shamanism. So I started using it in a ceremonial ritualistic fashion for chronic pain to try and enhance the healing capacities of it. And in that fourth, uh, you know, the fourth ceremony, I was in connection with the head medicine spirit, sort of la madre, like with la madre of the plant. Mm -hmm. And it was in the city that looked like Tron, full 3D, like city of light. And I am cruising down the street at light speed. And I'm having these visions that every other street is going to places where there's like culture use of cannabis. So we passed hip hop, we passed like past, you know, sadhus, we, we passed, you know, Ja Rastafari's, we were uh -huh. passing all these like zones, you know? And then we got to this place where everything started to look really similar to like Star Wars jump to light speed. Like it was all becoming pixelated and these long, you know, filaments of light. And then I popped into a space unlike anything I had ever, ever, ever seen. And that says a lot for someone who drank ayahuasca several thousand times. Completely. And that's what I was going to say. I mean, this is, this is the, the, the part that was so amazing. In ayahuasca, when you get an ayahuasca, it's hyper-structured. 
Mm -hmm. hyper man it is shapes colors and patterns it is dancing it is moving it is spirits beyond spirits beyond spirits or images whatever you want to call them it doesn't matter it's mm -hmm. being upon being upon being upon being in the millions and then the trillions and it goes forever in every way fractal yeah. this was just still and empty and filled with this like primordial substance of creation but nothing else that was it. And I have no idea how long I was there because it had no linear time associated with it. I came out of the vision at some point. I don't even know how. And I didn't even think anything of it because it was so novel. I just felt great. And that was it. And it just happened that the next week I was heading back down to Peru to, to do another session, series of sessions with ayahuasca. And so I was I was there, you know, drinking I don't know, 13 ceremonies in 15 nights, something like that. Because when I go, I like to, you know, just pack toss it in, it, just pack it in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a trip around the shopping mall, right? Yeah. So I'm just packing in and and, um, and about by the eighth night ceremony, something like that, the spirits came to me and they said, you're going to go back and structure that world for healing and you're going to you're going to give it to the people. And I was just like, I don't know. What are you talking about? Like, like, OK, 14 years of mystery did not prepare me for this message. Like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you mean? Like, we know how to navigate the space. We know how to change aspects of the space. But like, take a space that's this primordial soup of whatever. I don't even know how to get back. I was in Tron. I don't know. Right? It was <laughs> well, like first that. get me to Tron. And then I know I don't. And then turn maybe it. I can figure <laughs> out like how to get there. And so uh, but but the biggest problem that I confronted with that was that it took me about 40, 45 minutes to get there. And I had been trained to like hold concentration and focus like a hardcore meditator for that amount of time. I'm like, people don't know how to do that. Yeah. So how can we do this? And so um, I went in and I and, you know, I, I like I was in a state of consciousness that in in physics would look like 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 the molecular bonds, like like how matter is held together. Like that was sort of the state of consciousness and the vision I was in. And now put it in perspective, I'm in a single bedroom apartment, first floor in like an apartment tower in LA near UCLA, just to like think <laughs> like where this is going down, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we get, I get into the, the, uh, the ceremony to sort of structure this world, not knowing what's coming. And I, I started to look at it philosophically and when i did i realized that there was no room for for ego there's no room for self to do this there's no room for for you know personal desire to to actually do this like if you took this task very seriously and ultimately i realized that i was being given an opportunity to you know play divine architect for for like a model like like how like how would you do this you know yeah. like how would you do this you know how, Oh, you really want to like, you know, have the world be a better place? How would the world be a better place? Like, oh, you really think you can touch human consciousness? H how how would you do that? And so I got in there and I uh I I started to to build it in vision, knowing that what I was building was something that we would be able to share. And I ultimately coalesced it to nine universal definitions that to me represent uh the nine dimensions with in which human beings coexist, like mm -hmm. actual dimensions of consciousness. And once it was created, I started working with it and then sharing it with other people and working with it more and, and really coalescing it. And then I realized that we had mapped universal human consciousness. And I had, I mean, it took me a while to come to the realization of what had happened that night in, in ceremony, because really I was just looking for a place to, to be able to have like a true watering hole, like the true melting pot, like right. the true place that anybody from any tradition, from any philosophy, from any background, from any education level, from any socioeconomic level could find a place of peace and joy and harmony within themselves, you know, to experience an aspect of their life like that. And then when I realized to do that, we had basically mapped the universal states of human consciousness i thought okay we 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 discovered something big you know but it wasn't it wasn't like set out it was it really just happened yeah you know it really just happened well at this point everybody listening is trying to wrap their heads around what you're talking about but it's not even possible because i couldn't do it until i felt until it. Said, exactly so if you're up for it if you want to look just you can just look straight <laughs> into the camera and lead these good people into a little taste of, of what exactly you're talking about. You know? Okay, so the very first thing we need to do is just like 
get really calm and get really, really centered. And so if this is something that you want to take very seriously and not just listen to, I recommend, you know, taking a little time just to, to set a space, dim the lights or whatever, like make it really calm in the space that you are, because this is going to be sort of a guided visualization that's going to, uh, you know, help us tap into something very, very deep. What we want to do is first start by taking some short, deep breaths. You know, just like in nice and quick and then long and out and just get some kind of energy flowing and get centered here, here in our minds and in our in our bodies. We want to be able to feel it. There are four key realms to to consciousness that makes all of these experiences real for us. And the first one that we normally connect to is the mental plane. So we want to like allow ourselves to have an experience in the mental plane. In our physical plane, we want to be in a calm, relaxed state. In the emotional plane, we just want to be stable or centered or open or present, whatever that looks like right now. And then in our imagination, we want to be able to free the imagination so that we can start to, to model and understand the universe in a, in a different way. So let's just go through that first, just to center. And we can look at this just as sort of like a guided meditation or a guided visualization. Breathe in. And start to just let it kind of like just relax. Like if you're just going to just like really, really relax into your body and take another deep breath. Now we need to use our imagination and we need to use our mind. We need to use our body and we need to use our feelings to be able to find understanding of this. So the very first thing that we're going to do is connect with the heart. And if you want to, you can touch the space over your sternum where the, the heart is and just connect to the heart as an organ that beats within you, pumping blood all day, every day that you're alive. Let's also connect with the heart as an expression of emotion. We know that love is directly connected to the heart. We know that the deep feeling of bond and attachment comes also through the heart. And so let's just remember some times in our lives where we've really felt that like deep, deep within us, within our hearts. Now, what I want to do is link the heart and the mind or the brain together. And so I just want to use a very, very simple breathing technique to do that. When we breathe in, I want us to just feel like energy just spreading from in and going up to the mind and also into the heart. And just just feel that connection to the best of your ability. And now I want to come back to the heart. I want you to think deep, deep, deep within your heart, beyond the tissue, beyond the cells. Connect deep into the center of your heart, deeper than the molecules, deeper than the atoms. I want you to connect deep, deep, deep into the center of your heart using your imagination, that connection and that feeling to love and the direction of your mind to go to that place. It doesn't matter how you connect there. You just need to know that that's where we are. When we go deep into the heart, we're going to start at a point of quantum uncertainty. We want to start at a point that when it's a point, we know what it is, but we don't know where it is. And if we know where it is, there's no point there to know what it is. A fluctuation so, so fast that we can't see the difference. From this point, we connect to this point as one or love or here. 
This point is very important in our lives because it's where you always are. No matter where you go, no matter where you are on earth, no matter where you are in vision, this is where we originate from and this point is where we navigate through life. So this is one and love. The second is time. And I want us to define time as now. And now expressing everywhere in the universe at this exact moment. So I want us to imagine this point extending everywhere through the entire universe and that we are connected from this point everywhere in the universe that we know. And by universe, I mean the empirical universe, the scientific one where you see stars outside. At the same point, I want us to connect the I, I. Ever since you were born, you have been a single being and the single being represents you, the one you know, pure self-reference. The same one that was one years old, five years old, 10 years old, 20 years old. The pure awareness itself of your own existence right here in the center of this heart. From this point, we are aware of four realms of consciousness. I call them realms because they're like great containers for our perception. And from the very moment that we were born until now, or from the very moment we started perceiving, maybe even in the womb until now, there has been a constant series and flow of perception. And we have perceived via f these four realms. One of them is physical. It's your body and the physical universe. It's your relationship to physical matter and space. It's your relationship to all the other people in your lives and our possessions and our things that we have. And at the same time, we have a mind that functions through the brain. We have an imagination that functions through the extension of the mind. And we have feelings that function via the connection of the brain and the heart and the body. And so these are our four realms of consciousness. And they're emanated here from the heart. And they include the brain. And they include the heart. And they include the entirety of our being. So come into connection within yourself into the four realms of consciousness, which is mind, imagination, body, and feeling. Now I want us to use our imagination to conceive of every experience we've had through our lives. From the very first experience that you had that you may not even have a memory for, all the way until now, there is a single timeline. We have lived that timeline right now in every single moment. And in every single moment that we experience it, it becomes past. When we look at ourselves in the universe and we look at the universe, we see a commonality, which is that the universe and ourselves are always in motion. We're in motion in two different kinds. One kind is vibratory and it's scientific and it's measurable. And another one is comparative, like cars together driving across a road that are in comparative movement. That is very, very important to how we experience our own consciousness and how we experience life to understand that in every single moment, we and the universe move as one. It can be seen as two, three, four to infinity, but the movement itself is an expression at once. That expression of everything that is connected in physicality is also connected to what is in our minds, our feelings, and our imagination, which produces an interaction. And we all experience via this interaction of motion and vibration literally everything that happens in our lives at any given time is expressed as a single whole we have the love deep within our heart right now as a self-aware being of the entirety of our perception 
that is always moving and always interacting. And the totality of that is you or me or Aubrey or anybody else on the planet. And that is your whole being. When we look at that whole being in any given moment, what we see is that that origin of love is something that we all know and we know it as medicine and we know it as something that heals us. We know that we were born into the world a bundle of that love and we know it still resides within us deep even though our life experiences have done many things to try to cloud that awareness within us. And so this is our eighth dimension is our own medicine, our own love as people. Once we connect to that love, and we awaken to the entirety of our lives, we see that our lives are filled with many, many things that we call medicine, things that heal us, things that make life better, things that make us feel better. And if we really look at those, and the term that we use for them is medicine, if we really look at those medicines, we see that all of those medicines bring us back to the connection of the center point of love. They center us in our lives, and they help us release the fears that encumber us in our everyday existence. And so we start from the center point deep of love and we recognize that in every single human, we share the same love. We look at the time and we see now and we see in every single human we share right now. We share that we are all self-aware. We share that we all experience consciousness in the same four forms or the same four realms. The imagination, physicality, emotion, and cognition or the mind. We see that we are in one expression and emanating motion in and through the entirety of the universe at once that we are part of and that we experience through an interaction of matter and vibration, energies and things themselves that have in our consciousness tremendous importance because they shape the entirety of our life. But we found that in modern world, it's very easy to get lost within that experience and not really know the foundation of our existence or our consciousness, which is why we know that origin medicine deep within our hearts is healing for others as well as ourselves and that we can always connect to it. And then we can know that through other medicines, they can all lead us to that exact same love and that exact same understanding of universal truths for all of humanity, individually and collectively. That's it, my friend. That's it. That's the starting point. <laughs> That's the starting point. From here, what I would like to see, and I would like to put it out there to, to people, if they're interested in proving it, quantifying it, mapping it, modeling it, and turning it into technologies that can help the planet and help humanity, that's why we're here. And it's something that I would love to share with you know as many people that are interested. The way that <clears throat> the way that you've been able to, as you say, you, you've codified it, you've mapped it, and it's mm -hmm. it it it's not that it's different than what these other traditions are saying. It's just the structure that's been applied. You it's know, the like structure. the Hawaiian Kahuna's who have the Ha Pono Pono belief is very much in line with that same idea that we're all part of that one single point. You know, and and these other mystical traditions all get there, but it's spoken around it and philosophically there. But this is the this is the blueprint. This is the these are the bones for the math of exactly. this whole thing. Yeah, that's how I look at it. I think that uh, I claim no ownership in the sense of having like created these concepts. On the contrary, they're shared through all universal mysticism worldwide, and they've been shared for tens of thousands of years. There's traditions that understand all the different pieces. Something that was special to my own path was that in in my tradition there was no tradition, meaning that we could learn from anybody and everybody. So spiritually, I connected with all of the traditions worldwide to learn from the great masters and which, who I called the ascended masters from all the traditions. And the culmination was to understand the universal points found in each one of those traditions and coalesce them you know, for what is now a global humanity before each one of those traditions was relative to its own culture. But we don't live like that anymore. And so to bring them all together into a cohesive map now allows us to start to develop, you know, new healing modalities and treatment and use, you know, to, you know, expand consciousness, help people. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. You look at all these traditions and at the core, one of the core teachings is non-judgment and all these traditions, but a, 
very intrinsic part of these traditions is judgment of all other traditions. <laughs> you know, it's this this really ironic state <clears throat> in which everybody thinks <clears throat> their way, their ascended masters are, you know, are the path. But really what you're talking about here is there's many ways to the same road, both from the medicine side, whether it's marijuana, whether it's ayahuasca, whether it's going deep in a float tank, like I know you did today. There's yeah. so many paths to that truth. And there's so many traditions that you can get there. And the new way in this emerging world, this new world, you know, is going to be not, you know, finding one new path and shutting everything out. It's going to be the inclusion of everything, you know, and I think that's going to be the final way because that's unbreakable. That has the support of all different facets, every wisdom that's come about. Yeah, the traditions are there and, you know, they're all, op most of them, not all of them, but most of them are open to receiving outside participation. You know, you don't have to be specifically a member of the tribe to have the experience. There's endless competition around the, the traditions. That was always confusing for me, you know, which is why I always looked into them for what I considered to be their very best or their cleanest or, or you know, purest form and expression, ultimately, which to me came to truth and love. And I saw love as something that was universally shared and truth as something that was the expression of that love itself. Like the way a human being mm -hmm. expresses that love is, is truth. And that ultimately truth could be shared amongst, you know, an endless number of people, as long as there was flexibility and openness to what that truth looked like. And I thought that that would be a great platform to at least start to build a bridge between the traditions and also for people to start to be able to really unite to make a difference or be able to make a change or or be effective you know i think like there's so much emphasis in the world on healing right and i would like to start to see the emphasis on not needing healing mm. right let's start to measure let's our go success upstream. let's on, keep going upstream let's keep going upstream, upstream. upstream. Yeah. yeah yeah not how you. well we heal problems let's right. start to work on the problems so that we don't have to heal them and I think that we're just on the cusp now of that, right? I think it's such a dynamic time. And there are some, you know, really awake, really great minds that are all now starting to get really to work together. And that's never been seen before. So it's like, let's let's work together. Let's turn it into a we, not just an I. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the analogies that both of us like to use is if you look at human consciousness like an iPhone, you know, which takes a piece, takes a download, most of us aren't in constant communication with the mother cloud that's constant, that has the perfect source code, you know. It has iPhones updates one through infinity. It's sure. all available there. It's just a matter of what our hardware can actually accommodate, you know, at that given point. But all of these paths are really just opening that up. It's like plugging the phone back into the computer, back into the cloud. And whatever hardware improvements we've made will allow new software to kind of come through. And that is the greatest healing because those plans have all of the answers. You know, you, you hear these spontaneous remissions of everything. Well, how did that happen? Well, some forces that be in the body have the ability to reverse anything if the right conditions are present and i think a key part of that is just connecting and maintaining that connection to the source yeah the connection's really key consistency is key mm. right making it part of lifestyle is key but another another part that's also really important is perspective and one perspective that always blows my mind is that hu human beings are excited by animals but not by each other <laughs> right. even though human beings are the most interesting animals on the planet right. right that one and then the other the other side of it is to also understand that if we go back far enough in history all of the major inventions that have shaped the entirety of the way that we collectively live did not exist 200 300 400 500 years ago and so to really be open and if you have if you're inventive and if you have a, a mind for creation and engineering and and, you know, modeling and checking things out, you know, the cusp of new technology is every day. Right. We have the possibility of developing new things and inventing new things and using human ingenuity to continue to push the boundary of how we know life and how we know existence and how we know source and how we connect and how we relate. And so why not use it? Let's utilize technology. Let's utilize the mind. Let's utilize our Western education. Let's utilize mysticism. Let's utilize all of it to really make a very positive impact, not only in our own lives, but the lives of the other people we touch. Para el bien de todos. Para el bien de todos. For the good of all. Absolutely. It's a call to arms, my brothers and sisters. Let's do it. 
it's been a fucking honor to hang with you and you. Uh, i look forward to Same. a lifelong alliance and and let's do this brother yeah i love it thank you so much again for me too and uh kudos again to all the work that you for guys sure. do and you know, thank you all. And if you're interested in our work, uh, bluemorphofoundation.org or bluemorphotours.com down in Peru. And, you know, we're charity. We want to help the world. So let's do it. And each part of the world, before you help the world, I mean, one of these key concepts is becoming fit for service. So, you know, don't worry. You don't have to even worry too much about helping the world. If you're just helping yourself, that's the way to start. You know, get yourself fit for service. And then you'll be even more effective in helping the world. So it's okay to focus on yourself. You know? I would say it, it's mandatory. Yeah. <laughs> and the world I'm talking about is our world. Like yeah. it's it's your world that you live in personally. Yeah, right? That's, indeed. That is our world. That's the collective. Indeed. Thank you, Hamilton. It's been an honor, my friend. Thank you very much. Everybody, Thank you. peace. There will be part three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, but not this quickly. So <laughs> you're going to have to wait for the next time. Later.